Uh, hey, hey, newcomers. Uh, I'm Shai. I'm a data scientist currently at Zen City. Uh, I want to talk to you today about uh, creating Python packages. This is a talk aimed mainly at data scientists, although I guess some of it will be relevant also for uh, general developers. And uh, the message is creating Python packages, even for data scientists, can be very cool and interesting and beneficial, and even if you can't open source your code. So that's my, my takeaway here. Uh, I want to start with uh, motivation for my claim. Why, why should you care? So I don't know. I know how many times this happened to you, but to me it happens a lot. I'm looking for an old piece of code I've written before, maybe in university in some project or a course, uh, maybe in a past job or a private project. And I'm looking through repositories uh, on GitHub, maybe if it was open or Bitbucket if it was closed or a Dropbox if you sync it. Uh, maybe I fire up Jupyter to look at uh, Jupyter Notebooks. And after a while, I give up and I have to rewrite the code that I knew I kind of written before or something similarly. So I don't know about you, it happens to me, it used to happen to me more. And I can save you from that with packages. Um, and then, right, you do this face. Um, or uh, a close scenario, you're looking for an old piece of code through Dropbox and GitHub, you find it, and then you like copy it over to a new repository or a notebook you're working with an, another set of code, it's supposed to work together, you start running it, things break, you get this NumPy shape errors and data type errors, and you're not sure what the guy who wrote the code, who was you, one year ago, meant. And after like a few hours of debugging and rewriting half the code, it, it's working, but you wasted almost as much time as you would have writing the code from scratch. Um, and then you do this face, right? Um, so this also used to happen to me a lot, and it still happens, it's natural. But I want to save you from this. I want to save your time, I want to save your effort, and have this happen to you less. And one solution, one possible solution to part of this is packaging. Um, so what's in it for you in this lecture? I think that what you stand to gain here is first writing less code over time. Packaging can take a bit of extra code, but once you get the boilerplate boiler uh, down, it's not a lot of work. And over time, you ha don't have to rewrite your code again and again. Your code is used more, which is I think most people will find uh, quite cool. And of course, everybody around you, if you spread those packages, will love and despair from your Python, um, amaz amazing Python code. So this is how you will look after this lecture. And if you don't get glow in blue, uh, please come to me and I will refund you. And also, I don't have any math in my lecture, no equations and no graphs. So this is like a nice breezer. You can like chill and maybe nap a bit. I don't mind before the keynote, the very exciting keynote. So that's why you should stay here. What do I want to uh, pass along? What's the takeaways? The benefits of packaging to your code, to your colleagues and peers who um, might not be working with you in the same company, but peers like generally, people in the same field, and to you, um, which data science code fits packaging, and, and some good practices to designing a Python package. It's not gonna be a technical walkthrough for a Python packaging. There's a lot of good ones on the internet. It's just uh, good practices I picked up for, for small Python packages. Um, and maybe now faces in the audience turn to this, because this is what, really interesting, right? So let's start with the benefits. Um, so the, I think the main, the, there are many benefits to your code and they're driven by this, the fact that um, writing packages kind of introduces you into a lot of methodology and, and good practices that developers generally apply to their code. And that's because data scientists come from various backgrounds. We do, some of us come from computer science, many of us, but we usually don't program as much as developers do. And when we do, we don't, we write less code that goes into production, less code that works with other people's uh, code. Uh, we do less packaging and deploying of code and, uh, and applications. And so we end up having less of the good practices required to have code that actually works, works with other people, uh, works with other code. And once you take the effort to break down a piece, a piece of your code uh, into a package and think about um, how it looks to the uh, 
to the user, you have to do all these kind of things. Like you have to understand, you have to simplify and clarify your code. You have to document what it does. You have to decide on a clear, small API. You have to test it. And also you expose it to developer scrutiny. And developers all will demand these kind of things. If you uh, release a package, whether it's open source or even inside your company, and you don't document it well, so people would come over and start asking you questions and you end up adding the, the, the documentation. If it breaks, whenever it breaks, you're going to add tests that uh, test for the breakage. And hopefully, yeah, maybe not. This is Alon from Zen City 2, and I constantly break his uh, non-data science code, and it's hell to work with me. But I'm trying to get better, and I'm trying to uh, pass this along. So, so I think the key is gaining developer scrutiny uh, from other data scientists that might have def different background in development from developers who aren't data scientists. It's going to help make your code um, so much better with all these uh, uh, um, good things, also known as code that works, right? So data scientists um, need to get better at that. What are the benefits to people? And I, I pushed it together, uh, you, you and other people. So first, your code is used, as I said, more often in more places because it's easier to use, to import, to get working, so, and it's easy to get to. And there's also like nice ways of people to discover it if it's on GitHub or Pipey. Um, you have other people fixing and improving your code. So you'll notice w even when it's closed and, in and also when it's open, people will actually uh, open issues and tell you about things that are wrong with your code. And in some cases, people will um, uh, create pull requests with fixes. And I had this in my personal experience both in private packages in workplaces I uh, worked at and both in open pack small open packages I published on, on uh, GitHub and PyP. Um, it's easier to manage technical debt. It, this might not be intuitive, but I found it, it, it really helps. Um, one example is that and Zen City recently wanted to have a very simple model store solution. We didn't want to go to a full-fledged framework. There are a few out there. So I ended up writing a very small Python packages that helps us do a simple model store and separates something that wasn't separate in production before, the training of the model and, and, and the deploying it can be different machines with different capabilities and puts it in Azure because that's what we're working with. And and I knew, I, we, we knew um, that going forward, we wanted to have versioning capabilities for the model store, but it wasn't necessarily important uh, at the beginning. So it was something I knew, I wrote the API with versioning in mind, right? I knew it was like a specific issue on the repository. It was a technical depth for that component to add versioning in the future, but we deployed it first without versioning and later added it. So at the beginning, models rewrote the same model, didn't have the notion of versions, and it was like one file, and we overwrote it every time we trained the model, but later we added versioning and we started keeping different versions. And it, for me, it helped like to separate technical depth to different projects and understand what, what belongs where is very helpful. Uh, your code will be easier to deploy. Um, first, because it's easier to have a nice place you go to when you work with a package, a, a page with an API. Uh, if something breaks, you can add tests. You can use versioning as a way to manage right API breakage. So if you have somebody has a code that depends on your code, it can state in the dependencies. It, he's not going past 0.1.x for a version. So you can hopefully, if you're a nice person, you don't break your code and release a minor version. Um, so it's easier to deploy and manage, and it's less breakable, and it saves other people from writing it. Um, and so the last three points, I think, are benefits to other people, but I would argue all five are benefits to you because it might save other people, it might save the future you from writing your code, and in many cases you are, even if you don't deploy your code, you work nights and days with the developers in your company to deploy it, and so it's, it's a lot of work to you if your code is breaking. Um, and so now everybody's like, ah, oh my god, Shai, it sounds interesting. Um, so, okay, what should I package? I don't know, you convinced me. I'm gonna go home and try packaging. What should I do? So, um, um, I lined up five types of data science code I think is worth packaging. These are not the only ones, but I read in a good um, presentation guide that you should have only five, the most, at most five bullet, bullets, so you're not getting more than five. I guess there are more. This is the five I came up with. Uh, we'll go over them one by one. So the first step is extensions to existing libraries. I guess most of them are also relevant to developers generally. So extensions to existing libraries, I'll give an example. So I give most of the cases examples I had with packaging code. Um, I had in 
in work in case I wanted to try balancing my data and see the effect in some classification uh, scenario. I used a nice package called Imbalance Learn Package. Um, it, they have like sampler objects that are really scikit-learn compliant API-wise that can do upsampling and downsampling with various techniques. But I had a, a class distribution, a really freaky one. There are a lot of classes with very low frequency and two or three ones with very high frequency and a lot of classes in the middle. And I knew I probably should maybe downsample the very high frequency one and upsample the very low frequency one. Um, so I wanted like something to define a range of like 100 to 800 or 20,000 to 80,000 and upsample everything under the range and downsample everything um, uh, above it, above the upper threshold. Um, it, so it was like 10, 15 lines of code with the Inbalance Learn package, but it wasn't, it was just a function, right? It wasn't a, a, um, this nice sampler object with scikit-learn compliant that you can, like, as you can see here, you can put into a pipeline that uh, scikit the Inbalance Learn package provides that acts like a classifier, so you have something that is samples as it gets a fit as you operate the fit function up samples or down samples on itself which is you can then put into cross validation without like altering the test data fre uh, frequency distribution so it was it's much nicer to work you do a lot of advanced stuff if you have it in this form so i just wrote a very small as uh, just one class min max random sampler that takes the takes the imbalanced learn base classes and utility functions and kind of like adds another class that is in the same format and APIs, anything else in Imbalance Learn, it, it can be thought of as an extension to the package. I don't have to fight people to put it in the package, it's just package it as a small package, and if I add anything else to Imbalance Learn, like other classes and functions, it will be there, but it's very easy for somebody using Imbalance Learn to, um, to directly just also pip install my package if he wants to use this class and import it, and it works the same way. You don't have to know anything else. Right? This is just an extension to Imbalance Learn. So this is um, one use case, and everything. The only thing you have to do is just use a packaging boilerplate, co boilerplate code and add nice documentation. You've got something people can use and understand. Um, the second type is uh, adapting existing code to a common API. So my use case in uh, my experience in here was that I was working with Fast Text, which is a very cool um, text classification library uh, by Facebook. It's it is written in C or C++, I don't remember, guessing C++, and it has a Python driver or wrapper, but, um, but I was working at, with scikit-learn at the time a lot, with scikit-learn compliant flows and cross-validation and, and metrics, uh, matrix functions, and I wanted something that is like scikit-learn classifier. So I wrote a wrapper that takes um, the FastX Python code and make, wraps it into a nice object and there's like a lot of things in the middle that makes it like annoying, like you have to dump things into files because FastX operates on files and not on input arrays. And I had to add uh, the ability to pickle and unpickle, serialize the, the model and, um, and, and still enable people to um, initialize it with all the FastX parameters. Um, um, but, uh, but I think this use case is nice because FastX is popular, scikit-learn is popular, but they don't play together. So whenever you have, you have something popular you want to use and you want to adapt it to something else, this adapter is probably relevant to many of the people in the intersection of both communities. And I indeed posted it in a uh, FastX user Facebook group. And uh, I know a few people are using it. I found it useful, um, which is nice. And again, it's like taking scikit-learn uh, structure an API and in inner objects and making something that's really compliant with an existing API um, and it's it's easily usable by other people they understand what you're doing and they can just use it out of the box and it's a good example of somebody finding uh, a bug in my code I had somebody opening an issue about me returning lists instead of numpy arrays from predict and predict proper uh, functions which made my uh, classifier incompliant with um, some uh, read search and one versus rest classifier but he also issued um, uh, a pull request changing just four lines and fixing this bug. So it saved me maybe days or weeks down the line encountering this bug and then maybe spending hours or days on it. I don't know if I would have found it as fast as he did. So this is nice. Somebody did my work for me and, and covered my ass, which is good. The third type I thought about was automizing your flow. So I think if you have a kind of 
something you do again and again when you work across companies or in private projects, but this kind of like, it's your jam. It's the thing you do, it's the type of code you write, and you end up writing it again and again. Um, thinking about how can you, generali how can you gener generalize it a bit and package it is really interesting, and other people might find your flow close enough to, to theirs to use it. Uh, in my case, I, I, lo I love working with pandas and pandas data frames, and I notice I keep writing again and again code processing, um, Boilerplate, boilerplate code, the heavy lifting is done by pandas and scikit-learn functions, but calling all these things and parameterizing some things, and it's done a bit differently every time, but it's basically the same code, but it's very long, a long code of functions operating over data frames, and I wanted something that for me was easy to, in one or two lines, define basic pipelines to operate on pandas data frames, and I didn't didn't find didn't jam exactly with any of the existing pipelines for pandas, and I wrote something that helped me write something that for me was very concise, and very clear to read. When the definition of pipelines, the um, constructor like uh, the builder type of of uh, uh, syntax, and the way that pipelines are displayed when you pr print them with like a um, an index of where it's in the pipeline, and the way you can uh, it's like a it's very uh, sliceable. It's a, uh, I don't remember the name in Python. It's a um, series or, or something. And um, and it was for me very useful. I think this kind of code is super useful to package and manage separately, even if you don't, if nobody else ever uses it. That's for me. I don't really care. I know uh, more than a few people use it, um, but for me, it's it was worth it because in the last two years, I've been using this package daily, and it saved me a lot of time. And managing separately is really useful. Um, so I think it's it's a w type of code always worth uh, taking the time to package and make making independent from a specific project you do, so you don't keep writing the same code again and again. Um, the fourth type is data science infrastructure. So I mentioned um, the model versioning system, the simple one. Uh, I worked for Zencity, which is, and the same goes for a data set storage, um, like a local slash remote data set store for, uh, in Python. It's again something like that we didn't want to go into a big framework, so it's something like temporary until probably in a year or half a year we go into like a big model or a data set store and versioning system. I, they keep popping up because data science is getting really big, already very big. Um, but I think it's a good use case. Uh, data science needs um, as much utilities and infrastructure, like storage and versioning and deploying and streaming and whatnot that you have. And, and it might require small adaptation or big adaptation from what is done in other fields. And it's, it's code worth packaging and distributing because people can use it. Uh, and the fifth type is specific technique implementation. If you imp implement a specific algorithm or a model or a uh, technique from an article or a paper, um, People, if you if you don't have the IP for the paper, paper then usually probably it's a good idea to just um, distribute the code because the code is not going to be super, you know, that usually it's not that complicated. You care about giving it even to the competition. So this is a cool package, not mine, called Keras Text that just implements over Keras uh, free, very um, like new and um, well-known um, uh, deep learning architectures for text. Classification and processing. Um, so you consider like specifically Unikim, CNN, Attention, RNN, and Stack RNN. So somebody sat down and implemented in Keras these architectures, which you could have done also in probably like a half, uh, like a few, like dozens of lines. But then it took the extra effort to structure it in a way that has a constructor that you can just con send something maybe with some parameters and get automatically a Keras model file. So everything else, everything you get here is Keras and it's super compliant. You can just plug it into your code. And I think this is uh, super useful, especially now with deep learning getting super popular. Our um, architectures are something that we want to spread without writing our own um, frameworks. Um, so these are the five types I thought about. Um, you can use them later if you want to think about like what kind of code you have you can package. Um, so this is actually a bad subtitle I didn't change. It's not how to package, so maybe it's like so there are very good um, um, guides online to package, and I'll, I'll add some to my um, slides so you can go into and, and look at them if you need, although you can Google it yourself. Um, but I thought about a few good practices uh, for that I learned from packaging small packages. So these are, might not apply to big, famous packages, but I, I found they're good for the type of packages I wrote. So I, choose, I chose four, which is less than five, which is, again, couldn't go past five. Um, and they are do one thing 
generalize the use case, keep it simple, and advertise professionalism. And I'll go over each one <coughs> and say what I think. So do one thing. Um, I think this type of packages usually, and usually packages generally, don't try to do a lot of things at the same time. So don't try to do data processing, model deployment, and feature selection in the same package. Usually packages, good packages, in my opinion, and most of them, even the, the big ones, don't recreate a flow. They usually recreate a slice or flow rather than flow. So you have to think horizontal and not vertical. Um, for example, these are example. These are examples of like free flows we um, think and work uh, on in Zen City. So I might have a research flow for sentiment analysis where I like scrape media and story data and do all text processing and features and model exploration. But it ends there. But my production flow kind of uses a lot of the same blocks, but ends up also selecting a model maybe once a day and deploying it. So the, the suffix of the flow is different. Um, and then the print prediction flow is, um, might have a very different prefix, right? Because it's, it deals with data streams and not like with some kind of set data set script once a day or something. Um, and I use, I'm working on time series data, but the uh, suffix is the same because I have model exploration, selection, and, and deployment. So I think a good package doesn't try to recreate or deal with one of these flows, but rather with one of the slices that you can share, um, and a good package tries to generalize enough to give a good answer to different types of flows. And so you can see why having a good package that deals with something the way in your company even you deal with a, with a, one of these slices can help you write less code because you can share it across different flows. Uh, so this is, this is the do one thing uh, rule. The second is generalize the use case. So uh, trivially, things to you look like a constant. Think about if they can be a parameter of what you're doing. Um, and also, if there's a, a few ways forward and it's not too hard uh, to do them all or some of them, then do some and not just the one you're doing. So for example, in the um, uh, scikit-learn compliant fast uh, package I wrote, I wanted my use case was to take uh, pandas data frames that had only a single object column. That was the column with the text. I, I used a stacking classifier, so I had a data frame that I had to some classes, some classifiers inside wanted just the non-text features and one only the text features, the fastest one. So my use case was, I want to get a, a data frame. I'm assuming there's one object column. This is the text column. This was what I'm forwarding to fast text. But it, it ended up not being, I thought about it and understood that probably some people might have a few object columns and they want to use one of them as the input for fast text. And some people we work with NumPy and the arrays and would have to, can't rely on the fact that the uh, Pandas data frame has labels and columns, but will have to use indexes instead. So it ended up being qu quite simple to write. It's, I didn't write four classifiers, write one classifier with an abstract method that chooses the column. And uh, for my use cases, my use case I could re assume X is a pandas data frame and look for the first object column, but for somebody who wants to just use a NumPy ND array, can, um, it can drop this assumption, assume it's getting an ND array and return the first column or a column defined in the constructor. So I was able to provide four uh, different uh, classifiers that serve different purposes with, very, with, a, with not a lot of work. And I know other people use different classifiers than the one I did. Uh, the third, uh, third practice is keep it simple. So also I think very intuitive. Choose informative class and function names. Choose a very minimal API. Like, and I think one of the testing, um, the way to test both of these points is to, you, can, you should be able to write a clear example of how to use your package with uh, one or two imports from a package, no more, and at, at most four or five lines. Um, so, and, and this example should be clear to read. People should un be understand what the package does, just get the package from reading it. So for example, um, in the skift one, you can see that it uses five lines to import one thing from the class, define a data frame, construct the classifier, and then shows fit and predict with just, it's not like the code is, it, it means nothing with the two items of woof and meow, right? But people get when they read this, that this is a scikit-learn compliant object because it has fit and predict and it returns an array of, of, um, of uh, class labels. Um, and the same goes with um, uh, the PDPy package, which just three lines, with one of them defining a data frame, the second one showing that it's easy to define a, a pandas pipeline with one line, and the third one showing how to apply it. So you also get the gist that this is like a, a functional approach kind of, it's like an, a callable object. Um, maybe you also understand this, um, and you see how the, the data frame changes, 
and you get kind of like what the package does really easily. And I think this, this is super important. Um, and about advertising professionalism, um, it's easy today, especially with the open source, uh, to show that you can do continuous testing with Travis on every commit and maybe periodically, that you have good, good test coverage. Uh, you need to choose explicitly a permissive license because if you don't put a license, doesn't mean everybody can use it. It means private companies won't touch your code because you haven't explicitly given up rights. Uh, document well and explicitly encourage contributions. So in, in today in GitHub, it, this one way to visualize this is badges. So you can show these badges and they show one that you publish a Python package. So this is not just a repository. It belongs to a package. It has a version. I can see what Python version it supports. This links to a PyP page. Um, it's passing, so there's continuous integration. This leads to the Travis uh, uh, build page, test page history. Um, I have good co coverage, even though it's not the, the the only indication of good test coverage, but also the, the number still means something that it's not easily breakable and you have a license. So you thought about it and decided to release this code publicly. Um, I think if the readme is long, using a table of contents, uh, having people able to navigate quickly to what interests them is important. And if you want people to contribute, you have to tell them to do it, encourage them and show them how. So show them the code to clone the repository, installing a development mode, running tests, uh, contributing, tell them about the format you want from, for uh, documentation, for code, and whatever, because otherwise people won't bother to take the extra time to find out how to work with your code. And so these are like the four things I think are important to remember when writing the small packages. And it's basically what I wanted to say about packaging. Um, and the, the, the last thing I want to say is, is not about is not, um, it's for you, as, as homework. I want to really encourage you to go home, each and every one of you right now, forget about the keynote lecture, just leave PyCon, it's, okay, maybe later today or later this week when you find time, go and find some old code you've written and try to think if you uh, can find a piece of code you can package and create and upload the first version. There's an easy, a lot of good tutorials online. If you need help, email me, uh, come take, take my phone number. I'll help with anything with the commutation, testing, uh, whatnot. I created an example repo called Catloser um, that you can use like as a base, just copy it over and see how the testing is done and documentation and everything. Uh, it doesn't lull cats really, so don't try it on your cat. Uh, also, I have a very good experience in both uh, Neura, the last company I worked as a data scientist, and in Zen City, where I work now, bringing this culture of uh, a private inner PyP server to the company, writing both open packages for some of our code and open something, and the one that is, should be um, uh, IP, writing private packages. Um, and it, it's very, it's amazing how fast people catch up. It was in both places. It's a, like a, a shared resource and, a, a, and an interface between the analyst and data scientists also, because two groups of people working with Python to analyze data. It helped people to get like up their Python game. Um, people want to contribute to your packages. They want to have their package of their own. Uh, it's very cool. I, it's very simple to do. So again, if you want help with this in your company, uh, email me, call me, I'll help. Um, and that's it.